This episode of Suffer the Little Children podcast is sponsored by Podcorn, the marketplace connecting podcasters to amazing podcast sponsorship opportunities such as host-read ads, interview segments, topical discussions, and more. I'm just getting started with Podcorn myself, but I'm really excited to be able to connect my listeners with products and services I think you'll find valuable. With Podcorn, there's no middleman. Podcasters of all sizes can browse and choose opportunities right on the platform, set our own rates, and collaborate with brands directly without any exclusivities. You never give up any rights to your podcast, and Podcorn is there to support you at every step and ensure you're protected and compensated for the work you do for brands. The Marketplace mission is to give podcasters like me transparency, creative freedom, and full control of how and when we monetize. As you all know, my ultimate goal is to be able to devote myself full-time to the podcast and the blog, and working with Podcorn brings me one step closer to reaching that goal. If you're a podcaster, click the link in my show notes to sign up for Podcorn and start browsing sponsorship opportunities for yourself. This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is episode 46, Jaheem Harris, part two. Last week, I told you the story of Jaheem Harris, who died on July 8, 2017, after his mother's ex-boyfriend, who was allowed to babysit Jaheem and his siblings despite a no-contact order between the man and Jaheem's mother called 911 to report that Jaheem had possibly drowned in the bathtub. Jaheem's extensive blunt force injuries led police to arrest the man, who was ultimately convicted and sentenced to 50 years in prison with no mandatory minimum. This is a story of a little boy who was failed by not only Child Protective Services, but also the criminal justice system, and, many believe, by his own mother. On today's episode, you'll hear my conversation with Jaheem's paternal grandmother, Shay Kasten, who raised her grandson for most of his short life, and who Jaheem called My Real Mama. This is part two of the heartbreaking story of Jaheem Harris. Without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Shay Kasten. Today on the podcast, I have a very special guest with me, Shay Kasten, who is Jaheem's paternal grandmother. Hi, Shay. Thanks for joining me. Hi, thank you for having me. You're welcome. Do you want to start by telling us about him? Jaheem is, like you said, my grandson. He's my son's son. And I met Jaheem, found out about Jaheem when he was like three months old. One day I came home from the store and my son, who was 17, 18 at the time, was acting kind of strange. And he took me in the room and he was like, Mom, this girl is saying that I have a baby by her. And after I caught my composure, (laughs) I was shocked. And I asked him who was the girl and he told me it was Danielle. And that just, I was even more shocked, like, oh my God, no, because Danielle already had a son by my boyfriend at the time, son. So it was already like crazy. She was already kind of in our mix because of her other son. My son was served by the sheriff with some DNA papers, took the test and Jaheem was his. But that moment he told me about when um, I saw the paperwork, I had him call Danielle and bring the baby over. As soon as I saw Jaheem, I knew he was our baby because he looked like I gave birth to him. He looked just like my kids. Like, there's no denying it. He's our baby. And I told my son right then and there, like, this is your son. So I just started, you know, getting close with Jaheem. Then Danielle would bring him over and like, let me watch him and everything while she went to work. It was just great. Everything was good then. Um, even when they got the results back, you know, she brought them back over for my son. He, my son started being around them a little more and, you know, trying to get to know his son. 
But like I said, my son was 18, 17, 18 at the time, and he was not ready to be a dad. But anyways, Jaheen, you know, I just loved him. And like I said, Danielle, his mom would let us watch him while she went to work. Her brother would drop him off, bring him back, pick her back up when Danielle got off work. You know, it was okay. It was great. He was a great baby. Everything was going pretty good. June of 2013 came. And that's Danielle's birthday month. And she asked me, would I watch Jaheen for like a month or so for her birthday? I told her, yeah, I'll watch him. No problem. I suffer from epilepsy. So I get this call from the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics here in um, Iowa. And it's in Iowa City. And I have to be admitted for five to seven days. So I called Danielle, have her ask her to come get Jaheen. She refused to come get him. Like she outright told me no she will come get him when she's ready to come get him and I'm like I'm being admitted into the hospital in Iowa City you know you got to come get him and she flat out again told me no like it's no big deal I'm just like well what am I supposed to do you know I'm talking to the nurses at my doctor's office and one of the nurses even wanted to try to keep Jaheen for me so that I could go into the hospital I rescheduled this appointment a lot And that's when I kind of started having problems with Danielle. It was really awful. It was really awful. I rescheduled that appointment a lot of times. Then finally, it came down to the point Danielle's mom called me and she was upset that I wasn't keeping them. And it was just really crazy. And I'm just like, I'm being admitted. I can't put this off any longer. I have to take care of me too. So her cousin ended up coming to get Jaheen and took him to his grandma, Danielle's mom. So I ended up going into the hospital and she was mad at me and everything because I didn't watch him for a month. So she wouldn't let me see him after I came back from the hospital. And I did call DHS and I told them what was going on because I felt like this is wrong. So what am I supposed to do? I don't have family here. It's just me and my kids in this state. And DHS told me that I would have to give Jaheem up, tell them that I'm not keeping him and put him in foster care for them to do something. It was really stupid. It was really crazy. And I just, I told her, I said, I'm not putting my baby in foster care. I have five kids of my own and none of them ever been to foster care. Are you crazy? You know, like that's not realistic. That's not something I'm going to do. So Mm -hmm. I didn't get help from DH at that time, you know, and, and it did end up, her cousin came and got Jaheen and, you know, took him to his grandma. I went on to the hospital got that took care of, come back. She didn't want me to see Jaheim. She was like keeping him away from us, mad at me or whatever. So I didn't get anywhere with DHS with that. So I just had to like fall back and let her be mad, you know, like I don't know what to do. So she brought him back finally, probably after two, three months, she brought him back because he had his first birthday party at my house. It was small. It was actually kind of sad. Right around the time of Jaheen's birthday party, my son's best friend got killed, and he was 18 at the time. It was really sad. We were grieving about that really hard. So we had Jaheen's first birthday party at my house. It was small. Danielle was there. It was nice. It was, you know, just small and nice. It was, like I said, we were kind of sad, but we still celebrated Jaheen's first birthday. Danielle was there for a little while. She left. Jaheen stayed. You know, he had his Christmas, everything at my house. He stayed. We, you know, went on. I took Jaheen to the doctor because I was concerned about his shots. He wasn't going to the doctor like he needed to. So I took him to the doctor. My son, like I said, he was in the streets. He got in trouble, especially after his friend got killed. It was a lot of gang stuff here in Waterloo, Iowa. I had my son write a, write a letter saying that I had permission to take Jaheen to the doctor for anything he had to be caught up on his shots because he hadn't had shots since he was in the hospital being born. So we had to catch him up on all of his shots. It was horrible. He was getting a lot of shots. Mm. And I was taking him almost every month to get shots. It was bad. But that's important to me. He won't be able to go to school without shots. Time along, you know, I'm taking him to the doctor. Danielle's pregnant with another child. At this time, that would be baby number four. So Jaheem's still, you know, one or something, and she's pregnant, dealing with her pregnancy, that baby daddy and all that. I talked to her a lot. 
um, when she had her baby, we went and seen her. I took Jaheem to the hospital to see his mom and his new brother and just everything I felt like a grandma was supposed to do. During this time, it was really hard. You know, I was fighting for my disability. It was really hard. I was sick and I'm a single mom, you know, so it was really hard at the time. But Danielle was getting all the benefits. She was getting food stamps, Medicaid, everything. I couldn't get anything for Jaheen because she was getting everything, but he lived with me, but she didn't bring food over for Jaheen. She didn't bring him clothes, everything he needed. It came from his dad's side. My son had girlfriends in his life that treated Jaheen like Jaheen was their child, way better than his own mom. The best of clothes. Jaheen wore the best of everything. He had the best of everything. These girls helped me a lot. Without them, it would have been a lot harder on me. It sure. really would have been a lot harder on me. I mean, from pampers to new clothes every time he's growing, every time shoes. And he only wore Air Jordans. He had the best of everything. And it was through the help of these girls who loved Jaheen. I mean, they loved him and took care of him like a mom, like a mother. One of the girls lived with me, helping me with Jaheen every day, all the time. You know, it's just... So much help that these girls gave, and they truly loved Jaheen. They truly did. And I just really appreciate them for that. I really do the love and the help, but it didn't come from his mom. You know, she's getting pregnant, living her life. Jaheen's at my house. Even then, she was in an abusive relationship, but Jaheen was always with me. He was safe. He was help. He was happy. He loved music. He loved music. He can make beats. As a little baby, the child would make beats. It was so funny. Like, he's going to be the next DJ Khaled, and it's going to be great. <laughs> he's going to be a music producer when he grows up. You could tell he loved music, like, so much. And it was just so crazy how he could really make a beat at a young age. Like, That's oh, my awesome. goodness, he's making beats. His teachers, it was so funny. They <laughs> thought Jaheim played the drums. <laughs> it was so wow. funny. <laughs> It was just, Jaheim was great. He really was. But it was hard because his his mom made it really hard. I feel like I kissed her butt a lot. I know I did. Just to keep Jaheim, you know, and not have her take him away. Because I, it was times where we've seen her hit Jaheim. Nothing was done. I called DHS. You know, I told him. She, she'll trip him. She'll throw water on him. She's slapping him. There's no reason to slap a little child like that ever at all, ever. There's nothing he could possibly do to make you slap him across his face like that. Throwing water on him, tripping him as he's walking. That's not funny. She would drive me crazy because she would always call Jaheem her best friend. Hi, best friend. Oh, that's my best friend. I hated that. That's your son. He's not your friend. You know, I wish she was different, but she wasn't. She was very mean to us. Like, I was very helpful for today. You know, I wanted nothing but the best for her. And I told her that. But she was not a good person at all. She used Jaheim against us for no reason. And I've never done anything wrong to Danielle. Like, why are you taking him away from us after all this time? You know, you play in this back and forth game. And it was times where she had her own place and I would take Jaheem over there, but he would cry so much. She would tell me to come back and get him. I did. No problem. And as soon as I got him, he would stop crying. He called me mama. And I'd be like, I'm your granny. He'd be like, you my mama. Him and my son, I could be sitting down on the couch and Jaheem might be on the other side and my son might be on the other side of me. And Jaheem would say, Daddy, you better get off my mama. <laughs> and my son would look at him and say, that's my mama. And they'd be like, no, that's my mama. And that's my mama. And I miss that so much. I loved it, you know. Once Danielle came over and right after she left, I went into my bedroom because that's where they were at talking. And I went and Jaheem just jumped in my arms and he hugged me. And he said, you're my real mama, mama. And I just melted, you know. And I said, baby, I love you too. He would never call me granny, no matter what anybody told him, he would not call me granny. He was such a sweetheart. He was a true angel on earth. October 17th, 2016, my son, he had a date in child support court because at this time, Jaheen is with my son. 
living in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. He's and his girlfriend, Quasha, at the time. Quasha was so great with Jackie. Also, she loved the child like he was hers. He went to Head Start down in Cedar Rapids from Head Start here, where I had him at, because he was at the time living with my son, like I said. So he was living in Cedar Rapids. He was going to school. So my son's like, why do I have to pay child support if he's living with me? So they went to court, but Danielle was still getting the benefits. So the judge asks, who's getting the benefits? DHS, I guess, was a representative, somebody that was there, told the judge that I was getting the benefits, but I said that he was no longer living with me. But the lady failed to address that I wrote specifically on the papers that Jahi was living with my son, not his mother. When I stopped getting the benefits, Danielle got him back, not my son. The judge said, since she's getting the benefits, she got the child. She was like, they're trying to take my baby from me. Yes, we are. There's a reason. Where you been? He's been with us all this time. You live in the same city as us. Where you been? How in the world are you not consistently being a mom? I brought paperwork in to the judge showing him, you know, he's in school. Me and my doctors put him in school. She don't have him. She's just getting the benefits. We don't care about that. We just care about the child. But the judge said he was going to put us in jail if we did not comply. So my son looked at him. He was like, you're going to put me in jail? You saying I can't take my son home? He came to court with my son. But Danielle had him in her hand. The judge wouldn't even listen to us. He ignored all the paperwork. Like, you're not listening to us. This girl, this child don't live with her. She, he lived with us. From then, October 17th, 2016th is the day that damn Jaheen. That's the day that damn him. I'll never forget that day or that judge. Because if he listened to us, she wouldn't have got him. He wouldn't be dead. Was that also the date that the killer assaulted Danielle and she got the... He beat her up. Oh, wow. The day he, she brought him home, he beat her up. Because he beat her up because she brought Jaheem home. That boy hated my son and her family. I mean, it's so crazy. They don't like us. I've never done nothing to her mom. I've never done nothing to Danielle. Nothing but try to help her. Tell mm. her right from wrong. That's it. I've never done nothing wrong. But you can say if calling DHS is wrong, oh, well, but I'm doing what's best for my baby. When DHS did get involved once, they got involved one time, but it wasn't on the counter of Jaheem. Jaheem's little brother got admitted to the hospital for dehydration. And at the time, I was taking him to the pediatrician of her choice at Allen Hospital. And they were asking me about where is she at because they want to do a follow-up on the brother. I was like, I don't know. Um, she's not answering my calls. She's not answering the doctor's calls. So the doctor's office called DHS. DHS finally got a hold of her and took her to the follow-up for the baby. And that was it. I mean, I don't get how their way of thinking is. I feel like they helped this happen. This didn't have to happen. Absolutely. I called DHS. I told them how she abandoned them. I told them how she hit them. I got to put them in foster care. She called DHS and told them I smoke weed. Here they come knocking on my door. But mm -hmm. they also saw that Jaheen was in a loving environment. Jaheem had his own bed. Jaheem had clothes, food. He was in school. He got in school because my doctor helped put him in school. If Danielle was in the situation, why is my doctor writing letters for the Head Start? And I bet he loved it. He loved it. My mom going to school because he used to wake up early, like at six o'clock when my girls would be up getting ready for school. Like he would be going to school like and my girls were teenagers, so they would get their self up and he would get up with them like he's going to school. And he'd be like, Mom, I'm going to go to school, too. I'm like, you're going to go to school, baby. I'm going to get you in school. And I did that. And he loved it. Mama, this is my friend. This is my friend. <laughs> and I would pick him up. It was so, man, it was the greatest. He was so happy. He was around friends and kids his age and getting everything that he needed. And he was great. And his teachers loved him. And it was really good. It was really good. I just don't get it. That October 17th, 2016 was the baddest day. We didn't see him anymore until Christmas 2016. We took a couple. She said we could take 
bring Jaheim some his presents. So I just took a couple of outfits over there and a couple of toys that I had got him over. But it wasn't the huge amount of stuff. Like Quasha had got him enough stuff to fill up a whole entire living room. Jaheim never got to open none of that stuff. Corey, she used to live with me and help um, with Jaheim. She brought him so much stuff. Her sister brought him so much stuff. So much stuff he never got to see, never got to open it. I asked her, could he come over? She said, no, we got to meet her at her mom's house. So we did, me and my son. We went to her mom's house. We spent probably 15 minutes with Jaheim on that Christmas day. And that was the last time we seen Jaheim alive. It was bad. I got so sad. I got, I felt heavy. I stopped sleeping in my bedroom even before Jaheim died because I shared my room with Jaheim and I had my bed and he had his bed, but he was sleeping in my bed with me a lot. And I just stopped sleeping in the room even. I slept on the couch and it was, I got, you know, really depressed. And then like when we would try to reach her, she wouldn't answer the phone, you know, like I did a welfare check. I tried to do a welfare check. I called the police and I didn't know where she lived at the time. And I told him that. So, but I told him, you know, I'm worried about the baby. So the police had come back and told us that Danielle's mom said Danielle and her kids are fine over on Newell Street. Well, we're at on Newell Street. That's a big street. And that was all we got. They didn't lay eyes on, on Jaheen. You know, it was just really messed up. What is DHS for? What's the use of calling you if you're no good? I got to give my baby up to foster care. I'm not going to do that. And that was my option, either that or put up with this mess. So I had to put up with the mess, all the back and forth. Oh, you can't see him. Oh, here you go. Oh, you can't see him again. Oh, here you go. That's just too much. And I'm providing and these girls were providing while she filing taxes on a child that she don't even see. She was not a good mom. She was not. And she stayed pregnant constantly, just always pregnant. Boom, have one, here go another one. Like, it's crazy. And you're not taking care of the ones you have. This is wrong. That Christmas, like I said, was the last time I seen Jaheen. Me and my son both. My son ended up going to prison. I'm calling her. She's not answering my phone calls. She's not answering my texts. Right around May of 2017, my daughter got a hold of Danielle, my oldest daughter. Jasmine calls her and asks her, can her and Jaheim come to Jasmine's graduation? She told Jasmine, yeah. So when Jasmine came in and told me, she's like, mom, I talked to Danielle. I was like, you did? And she was like, she said she's going to bring him to my graduation. We believe that. I don't know why, but I was like, Jasmine, that's good. We'll get to see him and he'll get to see you graduate. Because Jaheim was close to my daughters, of course. We all lived together. You know, they took part in everything with Jaheim. Jaheim didn't show up to the graduation. And mm-hmm. my daughter was like, I hate that we even got our hopes up. I was like, me too. And she called her after that. She wouldn't answer. No answer. No answer. July 9th, about 1224, my phone rang. I'm actually getting ready to lay down on the couch. My phone said, Danielle. I answered the phone so quick. I said, what's wrong, baby? She said, Shay, Jaheem dead. And I looked at the phone again, and it said, Danielle. And I said, Danielle, what you say? And she said, Shay, Jaheem dead. I said, where you at? And she said, Covenant. I hung up the phone. I grabbed my daughter, my youngest daughter, and I said to Nate, Danielle just called and said, Jaheem dead. She said, oh, no, mama, go. We got to go. I was like, I know. I ran out the house and didn't even have clothes on. My daughter said, mama, you naked. I had to go back in the house and get dressed Mm -hmm. to leave to go to the hospital. I called my sister and I said, Danielle said, Jaheem dead. And she was like, oh, no, sister, don't go by yourself. Come get me. I got my sister, and me, her, and Tanae ran to the hospital, and Jaheim was dead. I just ran in, and I was just like, Jaheim, I'm here. I'm here. You know, I just really felt like if I could have got to him and just prayed over him, 
that God would have listened and maybe restored my baby heartbeat and his organs. You know, like I really felt that and they wouldn't let us back. And the people talking to Danielle and it was just a mess. And I'm just sitting there and Danielle aunt says, how do you think she feels? She's the mother. And I cussed. I said, I don't know how the F um, she feel, but a mother, she's not. All hell broke out. It was bad then. Then they wanted to fight me. Why? He didn't die on my watch. What you mad at me for? You need to be fighting Danielle. This big mom, her mom is huge. She's a bigger woman. And I'm a small woman. She wanted to try to fight me. One of the cousins stopped her. It was just a lot of chaos. You know, I'm there. It's me, my youngest daughter, and my sisters here of Waterloo. You know, we're not blood sisters, but we, we're more than best friends. So they're my sisters. It's just us. That's it. I'm thinking, oh, my God, my son, because my son loved his son. But my son in prison. And as soon as I said it, the phone rang. And it said unavailable. I knew it was my son. And when I answered it, my son said, Mama, what happened to him? And I'm crying and he crying. I all know. And I'm like, where are they saying Walter did something? And I said, I don't know yet. And um, I said, I'm here at the hospital. I haven't got to see him yet. And my son was like, oh, but he did for real. I said, baby, he gone. And my son hung up the phone. And he was already crying. And, and he just hurt me so bad as a mom because I couldn't touch my son. I couldn't hold him or comfort him, you know, in such a time. And I've never been through nothing like this because I've never buried a child. So I've never been through nothing like this. And Danielle said, I've had my baby all by myself for a year, by myself for a year with no help. Jay, you could have reached out and oh all hell broke out again. <laughs> I'm just like, what do you mean? You could have answered the phone. What you mean I could have reached out? You could have answered the phone. You didn't have to deny him good and let bad happen to him. This didn't have to happen. The nurse comes out and says, since this was a homicide, only people allowed back to see him is the mom and the two grandmas. So we get up. She stopped me at the door and said, you can't go back there. She would not. Danielle did not let me back there. Really? And neither did the hospital personnel. But she come back out, go, I want to see him again. Her cousins, aunties, and other people get to go back there, but I can't. I stayed up at night with this baby when he was sick. I mothered him. I love him. This is my baby. I raised him. She did not let me see that baby that night at the hospital. She did not. So then they got mad at me because people were posting stuff on Facebook. So she got mad at me because of what other people would say, people that I wasn't even friends with at the time, but I'm friends with now on Facebook. And people were starting to say stuff. We live in a small town in Iowa. Nothing's going to happen in Waterloo and everybody not find out. So people started to say, you let your baby, let this man kill your baby and all this stuff, you know, and they saying that I got people saying stuff on Facebook. That's what you worried about because my baby dead. I don't know what happened and I can't even see him. The funeral was bad. Trying to be a part of the funeral was bad. She didn't put us in the obituary at all. She didn't name any of us, just my son. So we were left out the obituary like we were not part of the family. And that's okay. I mean, if that's how she wanted it, because I don't need his obituary to prove that I was who I was in Jaheim life. Yeah, it seemed like she did everything she could to hurt us even more, even more. So I couldn't see him that night, but all these other people could. So I just left. I didn't sleep. I couldn't eat or nothing because I was just like in awe. It was a lot of mess on Facebook at this time. It was just a lot of mess. It was really a lot of evil stuff going on. Danielle was making a lot of posts. Sorry, not sorry. Jaheem's dad not invited to the funeral. You know, like, that's crazy. How are you going to stop us from going to the funeral? But at, at the time, I just didn't get it. Like, what do you want? You don't want us to say goodbye to our baby? You know, how? why are you being like this? I didn't kill Jaheem. He didn't die on my watch. Let's be real. Why are you mad at me? I, I haven't done nothing wrong. Why can't we go to the funeral? It was she didn't want us to see all the bruises that was on Jaheen. 
because it wasn't really until the trial. Like, we knew that Walter had beat Jaheim to death. We mm-hmm. knew Jaheim was beat to death. We knew it was a pack of frozen meat involved, but I knew, but my son didn't know. It was a lot that my son didn't know, and I didn't tell him until right before the trial started. So the funeral came. I had to go through our mayor. I talked to the mayor, and the mayor said, the police is going to be there. If they don't let you in, call 911. They're standing by. You are going to your baby's funeral. And we did go, you know. I went in by myself. I had her cousin on one arm and her aunt was on the other arm. And her aunt was saying a sincere prayer as I was walking up to the casket. And I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. But as my back was turned, I'm in the casket talking to Jaheim. My family walked in with my son, and it was bad. My son fainted, and it was so bad. He saw his baby, and he fainted. And Jaheim had a black bruise on his forehead. His little mouth was open. He had bruises on his hands. So we couldn't see his arms and stuff or his body or his chest, you know, because his clothes, but... The bruises that we did see on him, on his face and his head and his hands, it's just so, like, what did he do? And I'm calling the police. I'm calling constantly. Some days the police wouldn't answer. A lot of days the detective would not answer. They would send me to his voicemail. We didn't find out everything that happened to Jaheim until the trial. It was really bad. He did end up having a good funeral. You know, we didn't fight or anything like that. No arguing. He had a good homegoing celebration. So that for that, I'm grateful. I really am. He was buried in a part of the cemetery called The Hymns. And I feel like that's appropriate because Jaheim loved music. So after that, one day, the autopsy had came back and the police had called me down to the police station and told me they was charging Walter with first-degree murder. And I said, so how, what killed Jaheen? All they told me was blunt force trauma. And I was like, okay. So, I mean, I wanted a little more in detail, like what, you know, what happened? And they was like, all we can tell you is that it was blunt force trauma, and we're charging Walter Williams with first-degree murder. So I'm like, are you going to charge Danielle? When are you going to pick her up? During this time, like after Walter had been uh, arrested, Danielle, it comes on the news, Danielle was arrested for talking to the boy while he's in jail. And I'm just like, well, what do you got to say to the killer? What you do to my baby? Because she know what he did. None of that. None of that. You got to know Danielle. Danielle is a manipulator. She is slick. She's the devil. And she's a liar. She's a liar, period. There's nothing good about her. And I just don't like how she did because this did not have to happen. You didn't have to deny him. You didn't have to do that. And then to be letting him get beat on to say, oh, I wasn't home. You weren't home. Then that night, you might have been at work that night. Jaheen had old bruises on him. That He was very fair skinned. He was light skinned. And we call him a red bone. His little booty, it was purple and blue and black. His little legs had bruises, all old and new, old bruises that had turned yellow. He beat my baby. And you could see on his calf where he had the imprint of the meat pack on my baby. I mean, bruises everywhere, black and blue and yellow bruises. So, no, Danielle might have been at work that night. But like he said, I hit him all the time. Walter said that I hit him all the time. That's what we heard in court. That's what he told the officer. The officer said, so how many times did you hit Jaheim? He said, today or yesterday. He said, I hit him all the time. So you hit him all the time. Danielle, you ain't gone all the time. You at home a lot. Did Danielle say at trial at all that she knew anything of the abuse or did she deny everything? She didn't know nothing. She said she didn't have anybody to help her with her kids but Walter. And the county attorney knew she was lying. He knew who I was when I went to him to talk to him about this. He knew who I was, and I didn't know who he was. I said, I raised Jaheen. He said, I know. 
So, you know, I raised them. I'm telling you, this girl kept this child away from us and let this happen to this baby. And you didn't charge her. He spent me all the way because I kept asking him for months. When are you going to charge Danielle? Oh, well, we'll see about that. We're working on that. Why haven't you charged her? You charged her with violating the restraining order for talking to him. And she did seven days for talking to him. But the restraining order was active the whole time. She don't care about that. Just the fact that she had a restraining order on this man. But she had him living with her and you let him beat these kids. And you kept him away from us. You kept him away from where he was safe, from where he was happy, from where he had a life. And you let this man beat our baby to death and then say you didn't know? How in the world? You don't know. You live there. No, and if he had bruises that were older, I mean, those definitely must have been visible. We saw all the pictures. They're definitely visible. That's how I know he had old bruises. Even the guy who did the autopsy, the medical examiner brought it up. The old bruises. He showed us on the pictures. I seen everything. I saw my baby dead. I know why his mouth was open in the casket. That bothered me that his mouth was open in his casket. Like, why is his mouth open? But it's because Jaheim was dead when they called nine, when Walter called 911 that night. When the EMTs got there, they took him to the ambulance and intubated him, even though he didn't have a pulse. So when he went down for the autopsy, he went as is with the intubation equipment still in his mouth. He was frozen for three days after that. Is This is wrong. This is not right. How you just not charge her? The workers at the courthouse want to know. I want to know. Inquiring minds want to know. Why did she not get charged? I don't care about DHS taking her kids. Why my baby have to die for y'all to take her kids? They took all of them except the youngest one now. Yep, because she was pregnant when we went to trial and she had the baby after that. So I guess that one, she, they let her keep that one. But I don't want to sound like I don't care about her kids. That's not it. I care about those children. I care about their way of being, their mental health, because they've been through a lot, especially the oldest, especially yeah. the oldest one, because she's going to remember. So I pray for her. I do. I pray for her dearly. But when we went to trial, it was it was horrible at first. Trial was horrible at first, but it got better because Danielle has two cousins. And at first we was arguing and then it turned around and her two cousins heard Danielle say, Danielle said that she didn't have anybody but Walter to help her with her kids. Her cousins knew she was lying. They know Jaheen lived with me, too. And her cousins came to me. They apologized to me and been right with me ever since, have been good to me, nice to me, there for me through other situations and through the trial, like best friends. They've been great. They said, you know, you can't just let wrong go. You know, you know, we know she's wrong and they believe in God as well. And I love that. We've been great ever since. They're good women. They believe in God and more so they stand it up for the truth because this is wrong. She should have been charged. She should be in jail. And she got up there. I just could not believe that girl got up there on that stand and said she didn't have anybody to help her with her kids. But Walter, what I went through, you know, I'm better now. And I, I can't have to give God all the glory for that because I couldn't get up. I was so heavy. I was so sad and I couldn't do anything but cry and just lay there. It was so bad, just like a heavy feeling on my chest, on my whole body. It's a a feeling I never want to experience again. Depression, it was so horrible. I couldn't be a good mom. And my son, when he did come home from prison, he was like, what happened to you, mom? You know, my kids never seen me like that. I've never seen me like that. I had to deal with it, you know, but she killed my baby. They killed my baby and I don't know what to do. It's understandable. You'd have a severe reaction to it. It's just so traumatic. 
And I just don't get how this girl was not charged. Like, what do you mean? And the county attorney, it was bad enough that he let her lie on the stand. But I asked him, I said, why did you let her do that? He said, we had to do that. Otherwise, they would have said she did it and not Walter. They both did it. See, I could think like the phone calls when they had her on the phone recording her from when he was in jail. Mm -hmm. She was probably saying things like, why did you beat my baby? What did you do to my baby? No, that's just game. You don't know this girl. You don't know this girl. She a big liar. She's very manipulative. I'm telling you, this girl is the devil. He should have charged her for letting this happen. You had a restraining order. That man beat you so bad. You got a restraining order and you took him back. You didn't come ask back and ask me for help. You go ask the man that beat you for help. You didn't ask him. You let him back in. You on Facebook talking about how you feed him. You did. You fed him a lot with Jaheen food stamps, but you did not feed Jaheen. This should be a law. First of all, they say in our country is overcrowded, but you got to stop moms like this. You got to stop these young girls, these women from having kid after kid after kid by man after man after man. And you're not taking care of these kids. Then right. you run to the government for assistance. That's not right. That's not what you do. And it's just not right. There's so little that can be done. And, and that's the frustrating part. We, we can't take away their autonomy to have their children, but there's got to be something that can be done to protect the kids that keep on coming and aren't being cared for. According to DHS here, you're going to have to put your grandchild in foster care to get any help. I'm it's not so backwards. Foster care. That's crazy. No, you make her be a mom or you give them to me. That's all I wanted. Yeah, you were just looking out for his safety and his best interests. No, I, I can imagine this would be beyond infuriating, especially going through this whole experience and going through the trial and then feeling like no one cares or no one knows. Yeah, I just feel like nobody care and nobody know. And then like after Jaheen died, my timeline was full of nothing but babies dying cupcake oh. and all these other babies dying by the hands of their parents or mm. their parents' boyfriend. And, and I'm just like, when all these stories are coming out, why can't the world know about my baby like that? Right. You know, Jaheem was loved. He's special. He was a true angel on earth. And the angels was with Jaheem. He had an imaginary friend. His name was Michael. He did not know who Michael was. I said, Jaheen, where Michael at? He said, he right there. He loved me. He my best friend. He loved me, mama. I said, he do. He said, he love you too. I said, Michael love me. He said, yeah. I said, well, tell Michael I love him too. He said, he hear you. He right there. And it wasn't until after his death that I learned who Michael was. And I just feel so grateful that God had an angel here on earth watching over my baby. And I know Jaheen is okay now. It took me a while to get there. Not only did I go into depression, my daughters, my son, his dad, you know, it was it was really bad for us all. The trial was horrible. Walter was so disrespectful in the trial, looking at us and like the judge. Now, I'm like, why aren't you correcting his behavior? You know, that's intimidation. One of his cousins was there and he wanted to fight Corian and Corey, I was like, I don't even know you. You know, like, we don't even know who this boy is. And you want to fight Corey on. Danielle didn't even stay during the trial. She testified, got up there, lied, and then she left. She did not stay during the trial. I'm going to put on Facebook, you, ha you can't stay in the courtroom once you testify. That's a lie because Walter witnesses testified and then sat right down. So why couldn't you, the mother of the child, sit there and see what happened to your baby. Look at them pictures like I had to, like my, my son had to. Why you couldn't sit there and listen and hear everything that happened to your child? Because she already know everything because she was a part of it. And the county attorney let her get away with it. How is Corian doing with all of it? He has a really hard time. Like every year on Jaheim's birthday, he was born November 23rd and it's it's winter, but I still, we go to the cemetery. We have balloon releases, you know, it's something to celebrate Jaheim. I'll never let him be forgotten. I'll never let him be forgotten. And whether it's Facebook or whatever, Corian cries so much. 
Oh. And he's so sad on certain dates. It's just so hard. And I told him, you know, through this all one scripture, Nahum um, chapter one really stood out where it said, for the Lord is great in power, but is slow to anger and will not at all acquit the wicked and will have his vengeance. He will have his vengeance. He will not acquit the wicked. And Walter was wicked and Danielle was wicked. And anybody else that has anything to do with this was wicked. Because our brother came to me before trial saying how he could have saved Jaheen because they knew that Jaheen was being beat. I told the county attorney some of the information and everything. We talked about it in Messenger. So there's a record of it. And that's not good enough, though. It's his phone number, it's his picture, his name. How you going to say that? Right. He said the whole family knew that this child was being beat and nothing was done about it. They let this happen. I don't care who it is. If you knew this child was being beat and you didn't do nothing, you should go to jail before you go to hell. It hurts really bad. And my baby just did not get justice. No. 50 no. years. And he's up for review in 2022. Is that correct? Uh-huh. I've been in touch with the parole board. I'm trying, like, I know I'm probably the only one that writes the parole board trying to keep this man in prison. But I really feel like if the jury knew the truth, they would have found him guilty of first degree murder because this did not have to happen at all. And they yell wrong. They set it up, they set up there and looked like Jaheen was this poor little black baby, didn't have anybody but his stupid mom and her <sighs> stupid boyfriend to take care of him. The dad side wasn't there. Use a lie. The dad side was the only side in the courtroom. What you mean? We didn't testify. DHS didn't ask me no questions. DHS said they couldn't talk to us. Nobody can talk about this. Like, why? Why? You let her commit perjury. You let her lie. Made it look so bad. That's why the jury did that. I believe that wholeheartedly. If they would have told the truth, let let us get up there and tell the truth. Let me, let the doctor get up there and tell the truth. Let the, call in the school teachers. This girl had other avenues. She didn't even take them back to school. This is devastating. I just, I can't get over losing Jaheem. Like, he ain't have to be dead. You ain't have to do that to my baby, you know. You could have brought him back home like you always did. If Jaheen was alive today, I believe wholeheartedly he would be living with me and he would be fine. He would be fine. And as much as I call DHS, they never told me once about a China farm here in Iowa. It's a child in need of assistance. They never mentioned that, but they did tell me I had to put him in foster care. Somebody else told me about it. Like it's a form you could have filled out and it, you could have got him through a China form. And DHS didn't tell me that. They told me I had to put my baby in foster care. No, Jaheem not going to no foster home. He got a home. He has his family that loves him. I'm mad at DHS. Um, they failed Jaheem. Then they failed him in death. The county attorney, 50 years no mandatory. Do you know in Iowa? So he got 50 years state time. So when he get to one place, that time get cut in half. That's 25. So on that 25, he might do five to seven, maybe 10 if we lucky. And he's so young. It's not like he can't. Oh, yeah. He's so young. I was like, he was 24 when this happened. That's not affecting his life. This is wrong. Danielle even put money down. She don't think I know, but I do know. She put money down on his bail, on one of his bonds before the autopsy came back, thinking that he was going to get out. Her brother told me that. That's not loving up your child. You're not grieving your child. This is a life of a baby that was taken and nobody cared. I just wish my baby was here. And I mm -hmm. wish he would have felt any type of pain that he felt and I just didn't know and it makes me wonder like how many other cases you done did this in Black Hawk County let somebody commit perjury instead of charging them you should have charged her she got up there and lied and I just don't appreciate DHS why my baby have to die for y'all to do something thank god the other kids are out of the situation but you're right it shouldn't have to come to that it's just incredible how many kids every single state DHS type agency fails.
of all the cases I look at, I'd say probably 75% of them have some kind of DHS involvement ahead of time. So many of them are preventable. It's so hard to say what could be done about it. The whole system needs an overhaul. It really does. It really, really does. Because this is so not right. They're wrong. They're not doing their job. And here they always say that DHS likes to keep the children with the family or with the mom. Well, some cases the mom is not the best thing for a child. Just because you have a child, don't make you a mom. A dog can have a child. Don't make you a mom just because you could give birth. Anything could give birth. We got a homicide victims unit up here, a group up here, homicide victims group, and they work with the victims of homicide. Well, I didn't learn about that. I had to learn about that through one of my doctors, and that's how I got hooked up with the group. The county attorney didn't mention them to me or anything like that. My doctor, one of my doctors mentioned that group to me and gave me one of the girls' names, and that's how I got hooked up with them. Otherwise, I wouldn't have known anything about the homicide victims group. You need support. You need to know what to do during a time like this because you don't know what to do when somebody is murdered other than go home. And then it's like, now what? They're helpful with a lot of things and resources that you don't know about. That's something every victim of homicide should know that there is a group and that they're here to help you. But mine wasn't like that. My The county attorney was very rude to my worker. He wasn't nice to her at all. And she would email and ask questions and stuff and not get an answer, not get the email returned. You know, it was just a lot of lack of communication. And then he ended up, he, I don't know, he called somebody and she ended up getting fired from her job because she spoke up about how we was treated. It must just affect you and your family every day. There's no way you're not thinking about jogging constantly. Like all the time, all the time, every day. It's not a day that goes by that his name doesn't come up. He's such an important part of your life and he always will be. But he will never be forgotten one way or the other. And I can promise you that. That's the most important part of this whole thing to me is is keeping the child's memory alive, Mm -hmm. making sure others know about him and know his face. And he was so sweet. He was so happy. Oh, his little laugh, his little smile would just brighten any room up. He was a true angel on earth. He really, really was. And he looks just like his dad. We just love him so much. The trial was October and eight, October 2018, and that was rough to hear the lie and then the verdict. This is not a car accident. That's involuntary manslaughter. Not, I hit him all the time. What part did y'all miss? I hit him all the time. But if they knew that she was lying on that stand, maybe they would have sought something else. If you're able to go to the parole hearings, I think that you'd be Jaheem's biggest advocate, you know, to keep. Oh, I'll uh, definitely will be there. I'll definitely be there. And I'm going to do everything I possibly can. I just want the world to know about Jaheem. And I want them to know he was an angel on earth. They, they failed him. The system failed him greatly. Oh, Jaheem was the sweetest, funnest baby. Oh, he was so great. He was a good baby, even. I just miss him so much. It's heartbreaking. It really is just to have that pain in your heart, you know, and it just, you just got to get used to living with that pain because it's a pain that never goes away. You just learn how to live and deal with it. Before we wrap up, do you want to tell me a few things about Jaheem? I love when Jaheem used to wake up. It would be so funny because like I might be asleep and he'll come open my eye and <laughs> like, good morning, mom. Oh. <laughs> What's the oatmeal? <laughs> mom, are you up? Like, I guess I am if you're opening my eye. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't have a choice in that matter. I'm about to get up now. <laughs> Oh. And like I said, he would get up like six o'clock in the morning, like he was going to school, even before he was old enough to go to school. I said, you're up like you're going to school. He was like, I'm going to go to school, too. <laughs> he was just ready for it. <laughs> he really was. He loved it. And I used to see him when he was in school and like the kids holding the rope, walking to the park. And I would oh. see him like, look at my baby and just like him growing up. Yeah, and I just miss him so much. I miss his little beats. 
so much. I miss how he would just lay on me and come just, Mama, I love you, just out the blue. Well, thank you. I really appreciate this so much, and I'm so glad to be able to help you get Jaheem's story out there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We'll not let Jaheem be forgotten. That's one thing for sure. I cannot thank you enough. I'm very honored to be able to help. Although the legal resolution of Jaheem's case was unsatisfactory for a number of reasons, I hope his family can find peace and comfort in their memories of their precious little boy. I'm honored to be able to help them in any small way to keep Jaheem's memory alive, and I know that I, along with all of you, will never forget him. That's it for this week. Join me next week for another case. If you like the show, please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. And please subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to sufferthelittlechildren.pod at gmail.com. You can also subscribe on YouTube by searching Suffer the Little Children Podcast. Visit the website at www.sufferthelittlechildrenpod.com where you can listen to episodes and become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout out by name on the show to exclusive gifts. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at Suffer the Little Children Pod and on Twitter at STLC Pod. View photos related to today's case on Facebook and Instagram. Read more about today's case and many others at SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast was written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. Intro theme music is by Dream Note Music. Other music and sound effects for the show were created using sounds from audiojungle.net. Hug your babies a bit closer tonight. Until next week, bye guys. <laughs>